right. Good morning and welcome to the seminar for today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bob Hanner. Uh, Bob joined the University of Wealth in 2005 after a stint at uh, Natural History Museum in New York and then as a curatorial associate um, with, uh, with basically a biological repository. Um, and he spent a great deal of energy in establishing genetic repertoires or genetic um, uh, collections to support the identification of taxa in all kinds of different groups. You may have seen him in CBC as the guy who um, kind of pokes holes in, in the menu items on sushi and a variety of other fish products. Um, Bob is now an associate professor in uh, integrative biology. He's also associate director of the Canadian Barcode and Life Network. And he's been speaking to speak today on DNA barcoding and application parasitology. I was really excited about this until I saw the last little bit, the troubled marriage. And I was kind of looking for something a little more optimistic <laughs> than that to get this title. <laughs> thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. It's a great honor to be here today. And uh, I think we'll, without uh, a bit of a spoiler alert, I think we'll end on a more optimistic or upbeat note. It is a question, not a statement. Uh, okay, so before we get into uh, that, uh, specifically the, the aspect of barcoding and parasitology, um, all good stories have some actors. We've got to start with going way back to our system of binomial classification uh, that we largely attribute to uh, Linnaeus, although some of us in the ichthyological community might argue it was Patraeus Artidi who started it and Linnaeus just got all the credit. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, that was uh, where our first real standard around uh, uh, binomial nomenclature began uh, as, as a standard in the biological sciences. Of course, Linnaeus undertook classification of organisms for the greater glory of God, and it wasn't until about 100 years later that Darwin came along with his hypothesis of descent with modification via natural selection as giving us an evolutionary mechanism to explain the existence of taxa. Uh, so we now know, of course, that species exist because they evolved, and we have these two uh, characters to thank for that. But taxonomy has remained largely static as a discipline using the same uh, morphological methods that were practiced by Darwin a hundred years ago. And one of the grand challenges in biodiversity science today is answering the question, how many species are there on Earth? Uh, this diagram shows each square represents about 10,000 species. After 250 years of Linnaean classification, we've described about 1.7 million species. But the problem is we don't even know to what order of magnitude uh, the number of species are on our planet. Some people have extrapolated from uh, multicellular eukaryotes to suggest that there are perhaps 8 to 10 million species on Earth. When I talk to the protistologist, they laugh and say it's got to be closer to 50 to perhaps 100 million species. The point is we've literally mapped more stars in the sky than we've named species on planet Earth. Um, so this is one of the questions that really remains to be answered. And as John so kindly mentioned in his introduction, part of my, my background in setting up genomic repositories to help study species is really had a sense of urgency wrapped around it because our window of sampling opportunities for so much of the world's biodiversity is rapidly closing um, with some rather dire predictions of perhaps a third of all species being extinct by the end of this century. I really like this quote to kind of put things in perspective uh, from Bob May who in a paper published in Nature uh, entitled Taxonomy is Destiny once said, without taxonomy to give shape to the bricks and systematics to tell us how to put them together, the house of biological science would be a meaningless jumble. Um, I think we've largely started to neglect taxonomy as a science today. Hopefully we're seeing a renaissance coming back because of barcoding and some of the molecular methods that we have access to. But the sad reality is we're not really employing very many taxonomists anymore. Our collections are being uh, un underfunded, and we're really not putting the kind of emphasis into this discipline that I think it deserves. Another problem that we face with traditional taxonomy is that its infrastructure is very diffuse. 
We have collections and databases of specimens, various codes of taxonomic nomenclature, uh, which aren't very well harmonized in some respects, compilations of taxonomic names, data repositories, monographs, uh, surveys and inventories, revisions, and this mostly undigitized taxonomic literature uh, that makes studying taxonomy very difficult for the non-specialist. Another problem for our discipline is that most of taxonomy is based on the study of structures of adult intact specimens, uh, for animals quite often male. So this entire body of diffuse knowledge that we do have for this 1.7 million species isn't really extensible to the identification of things like juvenile or larval stages or eggs or fragmentary or processed remains. So many of the questions in the real world that would like to rely on taxonomy can't really use that body of knowledge. We need to make it more extensible. Fortunately, the revolution in DNA uh, sequencing has, has helped to address that challenge. Because there's DNA in every cell of every organism, we can use it in theory to identify species. This isn't a particularly new proposition. Bartlett and Davidson published a paper in 1992 uh, highlighting the importance of what they called forensically important nucleotide sequences, where they described the idea of if you had a, a sort of species-specific gene, uh, that you could have a couplet of gene sequence and species name and use that couplet as a lookup table to identify an unknown on the basis of its DNA sequence. Then it was my colleague Paul Bear here at the University of Guelph in 2003 who popularized the term DNA barcoding and argued for standard gene markers that could be used across large blocks of life. One of the problems that we had seen after the Finns paper was that different taxonomists studying different groups of organisms were using different genes uh, to, to identify species with which kind of put the user community in a difficult position because it meant you had to know what you were trying to identify to know what genes to use to identify it. So it kind of inhibited the large scale up of using molecular methods for species identification. But this ability to compare genotype information across a huge range of organisms turns out to be an incredibly powerful tool. People are doing some really interesting things with this kind of DNA barcode data today by being able to use barcodes to identify fragmentary remains like bushmeat. They can then understand what species they're encountering and once you know what species the bushmeat is, you can know what zoonotic diseases to look for and starting to document some of the public health risks associated with trafficking in endangered species in bushmeat. As John mentioned, some of the work we've done in my lab, uh, I'm primarily a fish guy, uh, but we've been building barcode reference libraries for the world's fishes. And back in 2006, shortly after I got here, we started engaging high school students and one of my graduate students to just go around and sample uh, retail outlets and restaurants. Our question at that time was, is our database mature enough that we could actually put species level identifications on products that we encountered in the marketplace? What we weren't prepared for was the fact that yes, we could identify all of the species that we encountered in the marketplace, but that about one in four of them were mislabeled always a species of a lower economic value being substituted for one of a higher economic value, uh, which caused quite a bit of a stir. As, uh, as John mentioned, it got us onto CBC Marketplace and a few other venues, and we've repeated these studies to see that uh, now there have been something on the order of a hundred of these kinds of market surveys conducted around the world by my colleagues in Brazil, South Africa, Europe. We now know that this problem is systemic in the industry globally. But back to barcoding. Barcoding has been characterized as a rapidly rising field by the ISI Web of Science. Since its inception with Paul's paper in 2003 till today, there are over 4,000 barcoding papers that have been published. Uh, it's on par with metagenomics and other subdisciplines in, in terms of publications. Um, and it was the parasite community uh, who were one of the first to come out in support of barcoding. At the time Paul published his paper in 2003, it was met with some controversy and, and even opposition from some of the established orthodoxy. Uh, but Nora Pesansky and colleagues suggested that barcoding would be a perfect tool for use in, in parasites uh, and invertebrate disease vectors. So there was this call very early on from this community. And I'm going to come back to this later in the talk. <coughs> 
Uh, today we still see a lot of, of things about barcoding in the news. Uh, you might have heard more recently the New York Attorney General's office um, has uh, issued a cease and desist uh, letter to a number of large retailers in North America for selling fraudulently labeled herbal products. Uh, as our barcode libraries glow, our ability to identi uh, identify species and different kinds of, of uh, preparations like these just increases and we're seeing that seafood fraud wasn't the only problem in the marketplace. It's also systemic in, in natural health products uh, as well which is a little frightening. But when these things start to percolate out from the scientific literature to the popular press, we often lose things in translation. And I get a little annoyed uh, when these kinds of headlines come out that say DNA scans could ensure your food is safe to eat. Well, maybe. I mean, we certainly use DNA uh, to look for foodborne pathogens like Salmonella and E. coli, uh, but it's not going to tell you if there's melamine in your milk. Uh, you know, it can help us understand where there are problems of substitution, but we don't want to overstate its, its utility. Um, and then there are other cases like this where the popular press is describing uh, a paper that doesn't mention barcodes at all in its title or abstract, but the popular press starts calling it DNA barcoding because they've taken synthetic bits of DNA uh, that don't match any known uh, living uh, species encapsulated that and use it as a traceability tag to put into products. Now that's actually a better fit with the barcoding metaphor than what we currently use uh, an endogenous gene like a barcode to tell species apart. In this case they're actually putting synthetic DNA into products to tag and trace them. But the popular press is calling that DNA barcoding too. So people start to get a little confused with what you're talking about and given the, the sort of knee-jerk reaction to things like genetically modified organisms in, in their foods, people are pretty unhappy about this kind of a use of so-called DNA barcoding. I argue this isn't actually barcoding, but um, again, this is partly where it's important to, to try and set the record straight, and that's part of what the first half of this talk is aimed to do, is to help convey a sense of what barcoding actually is. To do that, I want to step back for a minute and look at this graph of number of genes on the vertical axis and number of taxa on the horizontal axis. Right now we're looking at sequencing entire genomes, but that's still fairly expensive. The cost is collapsing, but we're typically doing that for one or a few individuals of a species. And that's what I would call sort of narrow but deep sequencing. We've got some exemplar taxa where we're sequencing whole genomes. On the other end of the spectrum, we're doing these lateral gene surveys that can be thought of as a molecular genetic transect being cast across biodiversity uh, that tell us a bit about the different entities out there. And these two axes, I think, are actually quite complementary because when we look at comparative genomics, it tells us a lot about the rate of gene evolution and it can help us focus on choosing the right gene to answer a particular question, whether we're looking at deep phylogenetic reconstruction or shallow uh, reconstruction and looking at species level differences for things like barcoding. On the other hand, looking at these lateral gene surveys like barcoding can tell us a lot about the taxa that are out there. Species exist because they evolved. They accumulate mutations, and this differential accumulation of mutations shows up in their DNA. It's why barcoding works. So together, with whole genome sequencing telling us about rates of gene evolution and barcoding telling us about the number of taxa out there, we can make more informed approaches towards molecular systematic questions and ultimately moving into the space of phylogenomics. So what exactly is DNA barcoding? It's a method of species identification based on DNA sequences derived from standard marker genes for animals. In the case of animals, we use a mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase 1 gene. In plants, we use a, a pair of chloroplast markers. In fungi, we're using uh, an intergenic spacer. The hypothesis is that for that gene segment, every species will have a unique sequence or a unique assemblage of closely related sequences. And that sequence is termed a barcode. Now, we can't use a single gene marker for all diversity in the world. CO1 evolves too slowly to be a useful marker in plants, which is why we've had to shift to looking at chloroplast markers. Um, it has a lot of introns in it that make it hard to amplify in fungi, which is why we've chosen a different marker there. But the whole point is genic minimalism. We want to amplify as short a fragment as possible because we're trying to recover this fragment from degraded material. 
Uh, so that's part of where we're looking at, yes, in a genomics world, more data is better, but in a barcoding world, we're really interested on in how little DNA do we need to sequence to tell species apart to make it a rapid, accurate, and cost-effective method of species identification. One of the problems that we've seen, though, with the entire edifice of scientific literature that's come out of the molecular community is that it's ignored some of the best practices of traditional taxonomy. Uh, this is a great paper that I would encourage anyone who's interested in this to read. Uh, the importance of being earnest. What, if anything, constitutes a specimen examined? Remember, I mentioned that paper by Bartlett and Davidson that suggested that this couplet of species name gene sequence could be used as a lookup table to identify unknowns. That's a necessary uh, component, but perhaps not sufficient. What this paper points out is that only 27% of the molecular papers that they were looking at actually had a legitimate specimens examine section with museum numbers for a voucher specimen in the name of the museum uh, where that specimen could be re-examined by a qualified taxonomist in case that uh, specimen identification was misapplied. So in other words, a lot of the data that we've been generating for the last 25 years or so is really fodder for the Journal of Irreproducible Results because we've simply not put voucher specimens down and designated how we're using these names. And these taxon concepts are very critical to downstream applications like barcoding. So GenBank is based on inference. The two elements of this couplet of species name and sequence profile are inferences. Someone has inferred an ID, but we don't know how, and we don't know what specimen they ID'd. And then they've inferred a FASTA file, or a finished sequence assembly, but we don't know how good that raw data is that underpins it. That's an inference as well. So the specimens and raw data are typically not accessible for secondary inspection for most of the data that's in GenBank today. Barcoding is trying to redress this deficiency by making the extension from inference to evidence and also archiving the raw electropherogram trace files so that the quality of the underlying sequences can be inspected as well as making reference to an actual specimen examined so that a qualified taxonomist can check the ID on that specimen if needed or use it in part of a revision as we start to see that some of our traditional taxon concepts may be uh, imperfect. So these voucher specimens are critical. We also need to denote which ones are being sequenced in museums. For the insects, we've been able to recover DNA barcodes from a lot of pinned specimens because they're stored dry. For a lot of things in formalin, however, formalin binds DNA to histone proteins and makes it inaccessible to barcoding. So we've had to go through and start de novo collecting for all the things that are in formalin because we've unfortunately not been able to get barcodes out of that kind of museum material. But herbarium sheets and dried pinned insects and dried study skins actually work quite well. We also need to think a bit about that raw uh, sequence data because that's how we infer the accuracy and the FRED score. So typical GenBank FASTA files don't have any quality uh, metrics associated with them. You need to actually have those raw trace files so that you can assess the error probability. And this is crucial. I think one of the early uh, challenges where we thought barcoding may not work is because we were conflating sequencing error with intraspecific variation. Over time, as we've gotten better Sanger sequencing techniques, we actually see that the sequencing error is quite low and that most of the variation is biologically meaningful and real. But for a lot of the legacy data in GenBank, we simply have no idea. So in 2005, 2006, I chaired uh, the database working group for the Barcode of Life community where we worked together with GenBank and stakeholders around the world to establish the barcode data standard. Um, if your sequence submissions met these minimum requirements, GenBank would apply reserved keyword barcode to those sequences as a flag that these sequences meet a higher level of attribution for the community. And the idea was to get a minimum of 500 base pairs, double-stranded sequence, uh, have the trace files and primers uh, archived, and linkages to the morphological voucher specimen. And the rationale for defining this keyword with GenBank was to provide the community with reference records. Uh, with verifiable and retrievable data that were recommended for the use in identifying unknowns. So barcoding is not attempting to recreate the tree of life or replace traditional taxonomy with DNA taxonomy. 
It aims to provide a universal molecular identification key based on our existing taxonomic knowledge that's collated into this barcode reference library. Now, that said, we do have to contend with the fact that a lot of our biodiversity remains undescribed. So, one of the things that we're challenged with when we talk about DNA barcoding is its use in species identification versus species discovery. Early critics said, hey, we have no problem with you using DNA barcodes as a tag to identify known species, but we have a real problem with you using it to delineate provisional taxa. Uh, that should be the, the purview of traditional integrative taxonomy or morphological taxonomy. Um, so where we've got species concepts with low ambiguity, where we know what they are, barcodes work great for DNA-based identification. But as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, so much of the world's biodiversity remains undescribed that quite often we find ourselves ourselves out in the space of high species ambiguity, where our ta taxon concepts are poorly formed or maybe don't even exist, in which case DNA barcoding is, in fact, a, a DNA-based taxonomy. And it's really a tool of integrative taxonomy. I mean, I think that in that case, it's a scaffolding on which we can then start to add more genes and morphology and flesh these things out. It's been seen as providing a provisional or an interim taxonomic framework where traditional taxonomy doesn't yet exist. So there are a lot of uses of barcodes as a research tool for improving species level taxonomies and associating life histories and genders to an applied tool for identifying regulated species. Uh, you know, or to a triage tool for flagging potentially new species. So think about it this way. If I've got the Peterson Field Guide to Birds in my hand and a stray migrant blows in on a hurricane from Europe that's not in my field guide, the best I can conclude is that species is not in my field guide. At worst, I'm going to say, well, it looks kind of like that and put a wrong ID on it. When you're looking at the DNA data, if it's not in your database, its sequence stands out as divergent from everything else. You know it's something new and something different. And that's how we can use it as a triage tool to flag the existence of potential cryptics. So the barcoding may be a useful metaphor when communicating with the public, but because of these different applications of its use, I typically tell my students, you know, to shy away from throwing around that word casually because it's a bit loaded. You know, if you're using it as a tool for molecular ID, explain that you're using it in a wildlife forensic or a molecular ecology context. Um, you know, if it's more collaborative, integrative taxonomy, explain that you're testing morphological taxon concepts with molecular data. Uh, or if you're doing DNA taxonomy, sometimes that's actually coming out of environmental sequencing, where we're just going out and shotgun sequencing what's there. Um, Sometimes these metaphors outlive their usefulness and they breed more miscommunication than communication. Uh, that notwithstanding, what I think is exciting about barcoding is that it sort of bridges microevolution and macroevolution. That's part of why some people were uncomfortable with it initially. It isn't really a good tool for population genetics because it isn't looking at population level variation. Sometimes it can, but that's not really what it's for. It's not enough data to re reconstruct robust phylogenies, so it's not a great tool for systematics, but it bridges that gap, importantly, between population genetics and systematics that have formerly been kind of divergent forks in our, in our discipline. It's also bringing taxonomists together with their, uh, with their user community and helping those people who need to, to do biological identifications appreciate the importance of taxonomists and collections to science and society. It's also an approach that's been used in the microbial community uh, for several decades since Carl Woese started using ribosomal RNA to discover whole new kingdoms uh, and just starting to apply it to eukaryotes that had had a longer tradition of morphotaxonomy that actually has kind of held it back from embracing the molecular revolution. And then lastly, one of the things that I think is exciting about what we're doing is it's taking that largely diffuse analog data from the traditional biological sciences and we're digitizing that information and making it accessible and bringing it into that genomic era. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about how we're doing that as we go on. So barcoding and its applications have captured the imagination of an international community under a project known as the International Go Barcode of Life program. That started here at the University of Guelph in 2010 with the aim to barcode 5 million specimens from 500,000 species by the end of this year. 
So far, we're over 4 million species, uh, specimens and 400,000 species. We look to be on track to hit that goal. Of course, that isn't barcoding all of the species, but it's giving us access to the vast majority of species of socioeconomic relevance to demonstrate the power of this approach. As I mentioned, it's headquartered here at our Center for Biodiversity Genomics, which also has the, uh, the world's largest sort of high throughput Sanger sequencing facility for generating barcodes. Uh, and also hosts the Barcode of Life data system, or BOLD. This is the custom-made informatics platform that we've developed to support that barcode data standard I was telling you about and capture all of these diverse data elements that we need so that it's a workbench for scientists who are assembling these reference sequence libraries. It's got tools to test the utility of barcoding and look for contaminants and other things. Uh, it also has a public data portal to allow people to identify a sequence against that database. But it's meant to capture this whole barcoding analytical chain where we're starting from a voucher specimen and moving through to get the collection data and keystroking all of that into the computer. Where was it collected? When? By whom? Take a digital photograph of that reference specimen and then in parallel take a tiny bit of tissue, extract DNA, PCR amplify uh, the barcode and then sequence it and put that sequence data, the raw sequence data, the primers and all of that information into a reference database to provide the community with support for that data standard and secure storage. Uh, we can share the data or keep it private pre-publication uh, and there are a number of different quality control checks and analytical tools on board uh, and importantly the barcode index numbering system that I'll talk about uh, shortly. So we move through this order uh, of workflow where we upload the specimen data, the images, the trace files, and from that we make a final finished sequence assembly. Um, and that information is all stored in bold. One of the things that I think is important for people to understand is that barcoding is a floor, not a ceiling. We want to start with that core marker gene, but you can use the Bold Informatics platform to add as many supplementary markers as you want or need in your particular case. So it's not meant to restrict people, but it is meant to be a kind of minimum information standard. Um, so it's really about bringing together that specimen and molecular data. Uh, the specimen data, uh, we have a number of required fields about the identifiers and the museum ID storing the specimen, uh, the taxonomy associated with it, uh, and then other fields for storing notes and things. Uh, and then we can batch upload records or you can enter them in one at a time if it's a small scale project. For the images, uh, we require that sample ID to be tagged onto the image. Uh, we actually now people have kind of underappreciated this aspect of barcoding. Uh, the Bold database is now the largest repository of specimen images on the World Wide Web. Uh, you're not going to necessarily see all of the morphologically diagnostic features to put a species level ID on everything from just looking at a photograph, but it quite often helps ferret out mis-IDs or contamination events and has turned out to be a pretty powerful uh, add-on. And then of course archiving these trace files with the details of what facility ran the sequence, when and where. Um, and then we can upload that package and then there's a trace viewer where you can look at the quality of these sequences right in bold. There's a primer database where you can either log new primers that you're using for your taxa or you can uh, select existing primers if you're not sure uh, what primers to try for your particular group of, of organisms. Um, same with the sequence data, we then take and make an aligned contig and put into the database uh, and upload. Uh, the console just kind of shows you who has access to your project. If you initiate a project on Bold, you can specify what other users have rights to come in and modify things like species identifications or your contig assembly. Um, give some overall statistics of things that uh, have matched contaminants. It screens for bacterial or, or human contamination, which is often occurs from people handling these museum specimens and things. Um, and then there's a record list that shows you everything that's in your project. Uh, there are tools to then assess how, how much divergence there is between a particular species and its nearest neighbor, uh, what we call the barcode gap. This whole idea that there's less variation within species than between. 
uh, but we know uh, some evolutionarily very young species may share a barcode or a closely related array of barcodes. So you want to look, use these kinds of analytical tools to determine how well uh, barcoding captures that sort of traditional taxonomy. Uh, and then there are ways to edit records. As I said, you can assign permissions to different people to access the database. Um, you know, and quite often we're seeing expert taxonomists coming in and saying, oh, well, I think actually you've got the wrong name on this species. Um, from there, you can publish all of this data to GenBank at the push of a button. So the proper data and trace files will go to GenBank and get that annotation with reserved keyword barcode. And then, of course, when you publish your papers, there's a bibliographic database in bold uh, that you can log those citations in so that we can now match specimens to papers, um, connect bold records across different papers, how they're being used. And then there's that identification engine where you can query an unknown to get an ID. But importantly, I want to talk a bit about the barcode index numbering or BIN system, where we're going in and just providing a tag, an alphanumeric identifier for each unique barcode cluster that can serve as a kind of interim taxonomy. Um, we've been able to tune and optimize this clustering algorithm by looking at lots of different data sets from species with well-resolved taxonomies, Lepidoptera, fishes, birds, uh, and start to get a sense of where we see uh, these kinds of cutoffs. Typically, we start with a seed value of about 2.2% sequence divergence. That's been a pretty common value of what we see as de delineating within versus between species divergence. But the BIN system is dynamic. Uh, it's based on the accumulation of data. So what we can see is if two sequences come in and they're 2.5% sequence divergent, they're going to get a different BIN initially. But if what we start to see over time is a whole cloud of of sequences spanning that entire 2.2% divergence or 2.5% two, two divergence, it'll coalesce into a single bin. Conversely, we might have two sequences coming in that are 1.8% divergent. They're going to be labeled under a sing, single bin. But if over time, as we accumulate more and more sequences, we see two tight clusters that are well separated, even at 1.8% divergence, they're going to split out into two separate bins. And we can use this as an interim taxonomic framework to communicate about this diversity and contrast it with our traditional morphospecies hypotheses. There's a, re there's a lot of justification for this because species are often known by several synonyms and we see this in the database all the time. Things getting put in with different names by different workers that share barcode clusters and this helps us to kind of identify these cases and work to resolve them. These numbers are not related to biology. They're just a simple standardized system for a database search. And as I said, we've kind of optimized that algorithm by looking at data sets with well-resolved taxonomy. And we can now automate species counts. That's what's really exciting about this, is we've outstripped our potential to sequence has outstripped our potential to identify things with what's left of our taxonomic workforce in the world today. So we can begin to at least give interim taxonomic framework through these bins to species that may wait for months or years or even decades uh, to be formally described. There was a recent paper that suggested from the time of discovery to the time of getting an actual Linnaean species name on a sequence takes about 18 years. That's crazy. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's typical of, of that discovery process. So as I said, I'm a fish guy. When we've looked closely at the 113,000 barcode records uh, for over 10,000 species of fishes, we see that it falls into about 12,000 species, 12,000 bins. Uh, for about 75% of them, the bins are monotypic. There's no conflict. In other words, a bin matches a species. In some cases, we see species sharing a bin, or in other cases, we see um, multiple bins within a named species, suggesting that there's phylogeographic structuring in the genetic diversity within that species. You could call them subspecies or maybe elevate them to phylogenetic species as is your want. And then in other cases, we just see uh, gross misclassification errors. Uh, sometimes we see uh, sequences that are obvious contaminants. We go back and resequence that tissue and find that somebody had made a mistake in the lab. But having this bin framework really helps us troubleshoot the database. So as I said, there are some reasons for this kind of bin discordance that we have to ferret out. Things like morphological mis-IDs, some taxonomic uncertainty where a revision is needed, or barcode sequence sharing, or contamination or flaws in sample processing. <coughs> 
So fishes, a group that have been taxonomically well studied, we've got over 2,000 unnamed bin clusters in fishes right now. Think about what that means for the rest of taxonomy when our traditional taxon hypotheses, even for fishes, are missing a lot of cryptic diversity. We've also got a problem in that an unacceptable proportion of so-called barcoding papers are still using outmoded approaches where they're just submitting a name and a species, a species name and a sequence to GenBank with none of the underlying voucher data. So we really can't critically evaluate the utility of a lot of that data. So what are the expected benefits for barcoding? We want to standardize the application of names, facilitate species IDs for all users, and highlight specimens that represent range extensions. Uh, flag cryptic diversity, and as I've said before, and we'll say again, highlight the value of collections and taxonomists. So I want to now talk more about the parasitology side of things and some of the work that we've been doing in my lab looking at, at food web analysis, where we've gone in and looked at the stomach contents of some top predators uh, in Ontario lakes. Uh, one of the things that uh, some of my colleagues in uh, IB are really interested in are these food web dynamics and trophic interactions. So we barf all these fishes, we sort through the remnants, and we try to identify it morphologically. And we can kind of say, well, it looks like these guys are eating these guys. Um, what happens, though, when you're trying to identify these bits of partially digested remains? Some of it you can identify to maybe family or genus, sometimes even species. But there's a pretty large amount of residual uncertainty with these identifications. When we start to barcode them, we can get species level matches. And that's pretty cool because it's changed our view of the food web considerably. And we're seeing that even in the presence of their so-called preferred prey items, a lot of these top predators are feeding on all sorts of other things that we didn't appreciate that they were actually eating. And that these food webs turn out to be quite a bit more diffuse. So the molecular data really resolves that in a way that we couldn't get at morphologically. But importantly, we're also now starting to say, hey, uh, look, this isn't actually a, a prey item. This is a parasite in the stomach of this fish. And we can put a species level ID on that. And then we can have these kinds of interactions linked in the bold database to say that this particular species, barcode, was connected to another species. And that's going to be a powerful tool that we can begin to mine when we start to look at these sorts of species interactions through time. Um, I also just want to uh, acknowledge uh, an undergraduate student, Danielle Andreka, a former uh, OVC undergraduate student who did her fourth year project with me. Um, she was very interested in ticks. We had a colleague who was a tick taxonomist who helped us gain access to medically important tick species from across Canada and we started to barcode them. So we had about 100 sequences from 26 species and five genera. Um, what you can see here is that these, these horizontal bars represent sequence divergence. So that's about 2% sequence divergence. So all of these conspecifics are very closely related to each other, but they're deeply divergent uh, from the others around them. And what we got was a very good match between traditional taxonomy and these barcode bin clusters, but there were a couple of exceptions. Um, you can see here uh, in Iotes taxonus, there are two deeply divergent lineages here that were morphologically ID'd as taxonus, so some cryptic diversity there. Uh, we want to flag this and get the taxonomist to go back and look more closely and see, you know, are these really the same species? We might want to sequence some nuclear genes and add to that and test that hypothesis. But um, a nice little project. And it underscores the pedagogical value of barcoding in terms of integrating fundamental concepts with practical methodologies. We've also had the, the pleasure to work with uh, John and some of his students on, on projects trying to ferret out barcodes for uh, Imeria and using, you know, contrasting the utility of the CO1 barcode with more traditionally used markers in phylogenetic reconstruction like 18S. Uh, this was, I think, a pretty big breakthrough to be able to do, just to extract DNA and then get primers to work on CO1 for these guys. Um, and what we're starting to see is that people are using this kind of molecular data in, in some pretty cool ways. Uh, you know, like showing evidence for intercontinental parasite exchange. That's kind of cool, at least to me. Uh, but there was a review paper 
uh, about this group of hemosporidians that was talking about all the different gene markers that are currently being used and how site B was currently the most popular choice in that particular group of organisms. So we're still dealing with this question of standardizing around molecular markers, it seems. More recently, we published a paper on the status and prospects of barcoding in medically important parasites and vectors. Um, to me, this seems like a really strong case for justifying the utility of barcoding when you think that you know, more than a billion people are currently infected or suffer from a neglected tropical disease, which in most cases are caused by a parasite. So what we wanted to know was how mature are our barcode libraries for these things? <laughs> uh, we also wanted to know why there seemed to be so few barcode sequences coming out for parasites. This thing that we called the parasite paradox where Bazansky and many people in that community were among the most vocal and back in 2003 saying, hey, we need this for parasites. But the accumulation of CO1 barcode data for parasites has actually uh, been outpaced by other groups and fishes and birds and insects and things. So 10 years later, we've still got <laughs> studies uh, you know, the, focusing on other markers and the parasites remain underrepresented in the barcoding literature and most fail to follow these barcode data standards. So the purpose of our study was to construct a taxonomic checklist for uh, parasites and vectors of human medical concern. I would have naively thought that there would have been some sort of a global checklist like that out there that we could just use to query the bold database and say, well, let's do that gap analysis. How many species have coverage? Boy, was I wrong. Uh, we actually had to create a de novo checklist from all sorts of textbooks and websites and things. Uh, that was a pretty substantial undertaking in its own right. And then we had to validate those names against current taxonomic authority files. And only then, once we'd created a checklist, could we query it against BOLD to see what kind of barcode coverage we actually did have for parasites. Um, so the, the results. Uh, had the greatest coverage for uh, mollusks and arthropods. Um, only six protists barcoded, not a lot. That's increasing. This, is, uh, this slide was from last year. Uh, but also what we see is that um, there's very little data. Only, you know, only a few, uh, you know, a couple hundred species have more than 10 specimens sampled per species. And we obviously want to have multiple individuals per species so we can assess within versus between species level divergence and make sure that barcoding is, is an acceptable tool for delineating and identifying those species. And of course, more than half of the data all comes from GenBank. So there isn't any provenance data about voucher specimens associated with this stuff. So why are so few barcoded? Well, there wasn't a prior checklist to kind of guide people to, hey, these are the hot buttons, let's go get these. Obtaining samples is difficult and requires collaboration. And it can often be difficult to separate parasites from, from their host tissue, so you can get contamination when you're extracting DNA. The barcode region and primers are not established for protists. Uh, some groups don't even have mitochondria, so we're going to need to define appropriate barcodes for certain protistin lineages. Um, and then there are some real problems, I think, with some of these whole mitochondrial genomes that we see in GenBank. People have held up whole mitochondrial genome sequences as kind of a higher standard than a typical GenBank sequence, simply because it was a whole mitochondrial genome. We just published a recent paper that showed that uh, almost none of the mitochondrial genome sequences that we surveyed were associated with a voucher specimen. None of them, well, with only a couple of exception, exceptions, explained how they even identified the specimen that they sequenced. So, I mean, where else in biology can you get away with stating a result without a method? And yet we do it in these molecular papers all the time. We just say, here's a species name and some sequence attached to it. No idea how I got that name or what reference I used to put it on there. It's a real problem. So, we come back to this community standard that I've been harping on. GenBank just has some edited sequences. Bold has the edited sequences plus a whole host of other information to help us make this data fit for use in molecular diagnostic applications. And then from there, you can publish your data out to GenBank, but we've still got that richness of images and trace files that we really need to make this data fit for use. So summarizing a bit, uh, you know, there were 18 phyla involved in constructing this list. 
Uh, we only focused on human, the species of human uh, medical comp uh, importance in its first instance. We didn't take into account things like spiders and snakes that some people would argue are, are medically relevant. We don't see them as, as parasites specifically. Um, about half of them, uh, well, 43% had some representation in, that, in, that, uh, in the barcode database. Uh, so we've got a ways to go. Uh, but as we started to actually review the studies that had published some data, we wanted to say, okay, how well is barcoding working in the parasites and vectors that there is data for? And what we found was that across the 83 studies we reviewed, the barcode results agreed with the author's taxonomic uh, preconceptions in about 95% of the cases. So in other words, barcoding does seem to work pretty well for identifying these guys. And there was little or no effect on the scope of the study in terms of the number of specimens or species sampled, or importantly, the number of markers analyzed. So if we want to study phylogeny, we probably do need lots of genes. If we just want to delineate taxa, a barcode approach is a nice first pass. So as I mentioned, most of these studies fail to describe vouchers. And to some, DNA barcoding seems to mean sequencing any convenient marker. We've seen a number of papers that use the CO1 gene and don't say barcoding anywhere in their title or an abstract. We see other papers that use DNA barcoding in a loose sense in their title and abstract, but sequence any old gene and just dump it into GenBank, which I would argue in the strict sense is not barcoding at all. Uh, so we're a long way from having specimen vouchers, images, and sequences available for all animal species implicated in parasitic diseases of humans. That's where I think it's a bit of a troubled marriage, is just getting the information out to redress some of the wrongs of, of our discipline in terms of not making explicit linkage to voucher specimens and making our data fit for use in molecular diagnostic applications. But hopefully now that we've at least got a checklist to show us where the gaps are, we can coalesce a community around building those libraries. And that's been one of the things that's been uh, a big help for barcoding fishes, is actually having a campaign and a website and a community dedicated to this cause. In the case of fishes, we had Eschmeyer's catalog of fishes. So we already had a hit list of what we wanted to get barcodes for. Um, we've now got Bold, the, bar the database to curate this information. But we need an interested and engaged community. We've had a fishbowl campaign since 2005. We've barcoded the vast majority of common fish species. There are lots of little endemics in freshwater streams in different parts of the world that remain to be barcoded. But by and large, all of those of socioeconomic importance are now in bold. We need to have that kind of interested and engaged community uh, for parasites. Um, why is it important to have a unified uh, standard marker gene? Well, I think what's really cool are papers like these starting to come out where Organisms shed DNA into the water. Aquatic organisms shed this DNA, and you can just go extract DNA from water and start to do shotgun sequencing on that DNA and find out what species are present in a body of water. That's pretty powerful, and we want to start to look for vectors of schistosomiasis or schistosomiasis itself or, or many other parasites with an aquatic life stage, or other species for that matter. But you need to have that standard marker gene. We can't be building a Tower of Babel of each group studying a different marker of convenience because it doesn't scale. And then we can't use these kinds of next generation sequencing approaches for biosurveillance. So on that note, I'd just like to finish off by saying that we're very excited to be hosting the sixth International Barcode of Life Conference here at the University of Guelph this summer. This is a conference that only happens once every two years. It'll be the first time that it's come to, to Canada. Uh, in fact, uh, it's been, the first meeting was in London, uh, then Taipei, Mexico City, Adelaide, Australia, then in 2013 we were in Kunming, China. So this is kind of a homecoming for barcoding, bringing it to the University of Guelph, and we hope it's an opportunity to help coalesce that interest in barcoding parasites and vectors uh, and building that community up. So I would encourage you to spread the word about that and then just like to acknowledge uh, some of the people whose work was featured here, members of the BARDA and Hanner Lab, of course my colleague Paul Bear and staff at the Biodiversity Institute of Ontario, David Schindel at the Smithsonian, my colleagues in the Fishbowl and, and the Eyebowl projects, and of course our funders, thank you.
sequences? Mm -hmm. Is it one set of sequence or are there multiple uh, sequences that are used for the species identification? Well, we, like I said, we want to start as a single marker as a floor. It's not a ceiling. So what we've seen in things like quarantine pests, where you may be triggering trade sanctions that cost billions of dollars to local economies, uh, what people in the North American Plant Protection Organization and other groups like that are saying is, we really like barcoding to identify quarantine pests, but before we issue some sort of a trade sanction, we might want to confirm that ID with a second gene. Uh, so for some of these things that are of you know, huge socioeconomic relevance, you might want to have a companion nuclear gene in place. What we've seen in most cases is that you know, species exist because they evolved, and we see typically very similar patterns in the different markers. But one of the key limitations of a barcode approach in animals is it's typically a maternally inherited marker. So you're going to misdiagnose a hybrid as its matriline. So in those kinds of cases where you really know that there is a hybridization problem, you probably, not probably, you definitely want to have a nuclear marker that you can contrast to try and assess the extent of hybridization. We've done some of that work in fishes uh, using whole genome scans and comparing it to the barcode data and, and a few things of geographic subspecies and things trying to infer the rate of hybridization. The things that I've looked at in my lab, it's pretty low, but it's a real concern. So, so are, are there any specific agencies who design the barcodes? Uh, That's another very good question. So it's, this is all a community-based standard at this point. Um, the Sloan Foundation provided money back in 2004 uh, to put together these working groups uh, to adjudicate, get people together and just say, come on, it's time to standardize. Uh, let's, you know, put the, the issue of which gene to use is perhaps less relevant than the metadata behind what you're sequencing. Uh, but you do need to have that standardization. So that's another topic we'll be discussing at the conference this summer. Um, you know, is who's going to adjudicate that standard as we continue to add more genes. It's really been investigator driven, people coming out and publishing studies saying this marker works really well and we've tested it in lots of different fungi or animals or plants. Uh, but we do have to be open to the fact that uh, we need to add sub ancillary markers if, for certain taxonomic groups if the current core markers don't perform adequately. Thanks for the talk, Bob. Um, so you talked about the importance of connecting sequences with a type specimen. And so what do you do if there is no um, example specimen? And, and how do you go about submitting that? And what kind of samples should you submit? So say I have blood slides of a parasite. Would they want DNA and slides or what? Well, just documenting what evidence you have and where it exists. as is, I think, the best we can do. Right, you know, so a, a lot of these things, um, you know, are going to be environmental sequences, uh, where people have just pulled them out of water, and we find <coughs> it's a new bin. Don't know what it is, you know, other than the bin number, and we don't have a reference specimen to it. But at least we know that there's something out there that we didn't know before, and so we're looking to find that kind of a specimen. In the cases where you actually have a museum specimen or, you know, with an accession number associated with it, then we want to capture that data. And so one of the things that I didn't go into because I felt like I was already getting a bit long-winded about BOLD and its features is that it has a lot of annotation tools so that we can go in. One of the things that you can't do with GenBank data where we know there are errors in those data sets is GenBank is hosted by the National uh, Library of Medicine. It's an archive of record. It's who said what when. It's not curated. So the only person who can change a GenBank record is the submitter of that GenBank data. In bold, I can go in and you do third-party annotation. So if there's a sequence, one of my fishes, and you go in and look at the photo and say, he's wrong, that's definitely not that species. I'm the guy who described, that, described it. And you, know, you can tag that record and flag it as a misidentification. And we can flag records with different keywords like that, whether it's an environmental sequence or a probable contaminant or a mis-ID. And so then it's a matter of community annotation of cleaning that database up and starting to look at cross-project concordance. 
One last thing I'll say about that that's been a real eye-opener for me is I said we've got a couple thousand bins for fishes that we don't know how to put names on. Uh, we've also seen that researchers apply names in very different ways in different places. We've had cases where the French are putting a different genus or family level name on something that's barcode identical to what the Americans in the Smithsonian called it. Uh, you know, so now we've flagged this as, hey, you know, somebody's got a kind of flawed taxon concept here. We're not trying to cast any judgment. Maybe you want to get a third party who's an expert to look at both of your voucher specimens and figure out who, if either of you, has applied this name correctly. And so it's that kind of community annotation and tagging that's going to move us forward. And you want to look at the total body of evidence. If I've got a sequence from a type, that's the gold standard. Great. We'd like to see more people who are describing species include barcodes as part of their type description. That would help disambiguate the application of names significantly going forward. Uh, you know, if it's not a type, is it from a type locality? I mean, that's one of the problems that I also see with the fishes. A current morpho species for uh, some of these things we've been looking at in Africa, uh, you know, a morphological taxonomist will say, well, you know, it's this species. Um, we've looked at a specimen that's in the Congo River Basin, but the type locality is a thousand kilometers and two barrier falls away. If that's the only representation I have is that one specimen for that species, and it isn't even anywhere near the type locality, I'm going to be pretty cautious about applying an ID to an unknown on the basis of that one record. So then you'd want to start to annotate things that are topotypic material and move from a typological concept to more of a population concept once we have multiple sequences for species. Mm -hmm. I think that might be one reason why parasitology is, is a bit slow at getting to, to the standard that Cole is looking for. It's because from, from my experience, we're trying to make sure that we have enough evidence and, and data before we post it online. Yep. That's what I want to go to Bold eventually, but I feel I want to do it with one collection first. Absolutely. Or put it up on Bold and just keep it private until you're ready to publish. Okay. You know, that's, that's the main thing. Because what's exciting about that is someone can still match an ID to your data. If your data is private and you're not sharing it, at least the ID engine can say it matches a private sequence. And you can contact a Bold administrator and so now I can, they'll send, give me your email. And I can say, hey, I, I just sequenced some seawater, and I got a match to something in one of your projects. Maybe we ought to be collaborating. That's great. That's a great tool. To what extent is that consensus about species definition at the barcode level? Because at one point, you used the word species, and then you corrected yourself saying bin number. So I didn't know whether that implied yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think for the entire discipline as a whole, we, we still have yet to really settle on a species definition. Uh, there are at least, you know, 30 of them out there, and uh, Rick Maiden and Kevin DeCaras have both written nice review papers trying to get beyond the infighting over whose species concept is better to say, let's use a, a kind of umbrella concept uh, hearkening back more towards something like uh, George Gaylord Simpson's evolutionary uh, trajectory that's, you know, it's a nice, it's an evolutionary entity. Well, that's a nice sort of overarching definition, but it's not operational. And then we've got a whole bunch of different operational species concepts that we can use to try and get at what are those evolutionarily independent lineages. So the bins are just trying to go in and say, where do we see clusters that are distinct from each other? And that's an interim taxonomic framework that what we see largely corresponds to species concepts as we currently uh, attribute them to various groups of organisms. But I honestly am not sure I know what a species is at this point. That's kind of what I like about the bins. I can just start to map things, you know, and I, and I see these cases in the fishes a lot where we see deeply divergent genetic lineages, but there's one species name that's currently applied to them. And you think, oh, wow, look at all this cryptic diversity. Isn't that cool? You know, we can describe some new species. And then you go back and you realize, oh, wait a minute. More than half of these things were described 150 years ago. But so-and-so came along after Ernst Meyer when lumping was in fashion instead of splitting and synonymized all these things. Guess what? The 18th century naturalists who were really good at looking at specimens were, had it closer to the mark than the lumper who came in 50 years later and said, oh, they're all just subspecies. So, I don't know, I, but I kind of like the bins because I get down to more of a phylogeographic level of signal. 
So I can not only oftentimes place an unknown to a species, but a region where it came from. Yeah, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. The question is that whether we should take only some very standard sequences for this barcode uh, purpose, yeah. identification of species. Yes, yeah, I would say so. I mean, that's, and you know, we can add whole genomes for exemplars as the cost of sequencing continues to collapse. Um, but I think, you know, the first pass, and part of that slide that I showed early on of sort of the X and Y axis of number of genes versus number of sequences, that we're better served, at least from my perspective, as, a, as an evolutionary biologist interested in, in diversity of species more than genes, I think we get more out of sequencing a short marker gene across a lot of specimens than, than we get out of sequencing a lot of genes from a few exemplar species. But I'm not trying to, you know, denigrate the importance of comparative genomics. I'm just more personally interested in, uh, you know, the, the tax on a diversity angle. And I think we, we get at that very parsimoniously by s using just a, uh, one or a few marker genes. Yeah. 